Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for each person here or watching today. Lord, we just pray that whether we're celebrating victory on the mountaintop or, Lord, we're trying to get through the deep, dark despair in life. Lord, wherever we are in that spectrum, Lord, we just pray that you would reach out and send your Holy Spirit to touch each one of us today. Mm -hmm. Lord, use Pastor Izzy to feed us, to feed your sheep. Lord, as the good shepherd, Lord, help us to walk in your ways and to see who you are and how much love you have for us. We ask that now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5? Galatians 5, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We got all the way through the first verse of chapter 5. Woohoo! No, we were just finishing chapter 4, and it tied into chapter 5. It couldn't just exactly... St- you know, sometimes if you're reading your Bible, you ever wonder how sometimes the chapters stop in kind of funny places? It's like it, it breaks the thought up. It doesn't really flow. It's because the chapters weren't there when it was written. We added the chapters and verses after the fact. These were just continuous letters. When they were written, they were written, this particular letter by the Apostle Paul to the church at Galatia. And he, he's been writing about a bewitching that had happened to the Galatian church. You know, in chapter 3, he said, who's bewitched you? Who, who put a curse on you guys? You began by the Spirit, and he asked him, I got a question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by, by works of the law or by hearing with faith? How did they get the Holy Ghost? And he already knew the answer, but sometimes when someone has a spell spiritually cast over them, they're blind. And so he had to pull the blinders off and say, hey, the work of God's Spirit happens because we have faith. We hear about the Lord, our faith grows, and God gives us his Holy Spirit to help us. And yet, Paul, this this particular idea of working the works of the law was that prevalent back in Paul's day you know in Judaism were the were the Jewish folks into working out their salvation so to speak by fulfilling the law they tried to do all the different things in the Levitical law now if you if you want to try that I don't recommend it you got to start with the law of Moses that was given in Exodus 20 the Ten Commandments and you start there and you and you and you do the Ten Commandments but then you go further and you come to the, you know, the, when you do your, new, your Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, what's the next book? Leviticus. Well, that's a dry read. 613 statutes. They take the Ten Commandments and they break them down into subcategories of the Ten Commandments. And they break them into these little teeny details. If your neighbor's ox gores your ox, then you have to take your ox and replace their ox and cut the other ox and you guys share the meat and you know and all this and you're like what now today we're going to see Paul is going to say how how to approach the law as a Christian do we do we are we under the law by the way under those 613 statues are we under the 10 commandments anymore no because it says Jesus came he said not to abolish the law but Jesus came to fulfill it and in fulfilling the law he said i give you guys a new commandment now and his commandment actually i like it because it's really not new but he says this is my commandment and and he makes it a lot easier his commandment was that we love one another right and it's not if i love my neighbor and my ox does something to their ox if i'm truly loving my neighbor will i not want to do what's right I don't need the book of Leviticus to tell me I have to take my ox and replace his ox and take the meat and share the, you know. I don't need the law to teach me to do the right thing for my neighbor if I'm doing the spirit of the law, which is love. And Paul, he saw that the Jews had crept into the church at Galatia and started trying to put a trip on these new Christians and trying to tell them, yeah, it's good you got Jesus and everything, but you know you got to keep all the Ten Commandments and you got to keep the Levitical law. And you, you know, you got to get circumcised because they were Gentiles. And you got to join our club. 
And I want to show you what Paul has to say to this church because they're, they're just rejoicing that God gave them the gift of salvation. That God gave them the gift of his Holy Spirit. And now some guys are coming along. Paul says they're actually troubling these poor new believers with a heavy weight. A weight that in another one of Paul's epistles, he says, we Jews, Paul was a Jew, by the way. He says, we Jews can't even handle the yoke of the law. We don't even carry this burden well. Why are we putting the burden what we don't do on the poor Gentiles? As if, you know, hey, guys, join us in our suffering or something, you know. Why do we do that? And Paul says, he's got, a, he's got an answer for these guys that do this. Now, just a quick question before I read you this chapter. Do people make up rules in churches to add to the, to the work what Jesus has done? You know, maybe I'm just an anti-rule kind of guy, but I think if we're going to follow anybody, we should be following Jesus. And if we're going to do anybody's rules, we should do his. He said when the, that attorney came to him and tested him, what's the greatest statute in the law? And Jesus said, how, do, how does it read to you? He said, well, love the Lord with all your heart. He quotes there from the law. Love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And the second, love your what? Neighbor as yourself. And she said, good. You got it. Hit it on the head. Go and do so. And, and it says, and wishing to justify himself. He said, and who is my neighbor? And that's when Jesus taught the parable of the Good Samaritan who, you know, found that guy that was beaten and stripped and robbed and put him on his own beast of burden and took him to the inn and said, here, take care of the man and anything more it costs you when I get back, I'll, I'll pay for him. And, but the man who picked up the Jewish beat up guy, he was a Samaritan in the story. Now, Samaritans to the Jews, Jews were told they're not to marry outside of their race, so... Um, the Samaritans, if you're not familiar with where they came from, they're actually p half Jews. When the Assyrians came in, I'm trying to think of what year it was. I, I know this, but it's, it's do your homework. Just look it up. They, the Assyrians came in. They, they captured some of the northern tribes of Israel, and they took the women. They killed the men, and they took the women and went into them to humiliate them as part of conquering them, and they got the, the girls pregnant. Well, the offspring became that half-breed, you know, and it was an insult because this is, these children are children of your enemy, yet they're born from your women. So it was really like a catch-22, you know, the Samaritans, they would have no dealings with the Jews if they were real devout. And Jesus, when he tells the parable, he says, and a Samaritan came along. Now, before that, he said there was first a priest that came by and saw the man beat up by the robbers, and he just walked over this way, like can't can't be bothered. I gotta, and and skipped going to see the guy, you know, and help him. And then a, a Levite, one of the guys born from the tribe of Levite, they saw him and they walked by. But then the third person who came, a Samaritan, one of the ones the Jews considered, oh, bad. He's the one. Who showed mercy. Now Jesus asked the attorney, which one of them proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among, uh, into the hands of the thieves? And he said, well, I guess the guy who showed mercy. Didn't even want to say Samaritan, you know? Like, I can't even say that word. I'll just... <laughs> it's like the Fonz trying to say sorry, you know, he can't do it. He's like, <laughs> the guy who showed mercy. And what was Jesus' response to him? And you go and do the same. You know, true Christianity isn't hard. We just have to show mercy. We receive mercy, we're supposed to give mercy. We receive grace, we're supposed to give grace. We receive the, the gift of everlasting life from, as a gift. Why are we going to turn it into something we charge for now? I mean, I've seen churches, they're like charging we can give you the secrets to get into heaven, but it's going to cost you. you got to buy our book or our CD packet, you know, on DVD for only nineteen ninety nine. You can learn how to get salvation. Call now, you get two. Call now, yeah. Get two gifts, one for you and one for your friend. 
What kind of stuff is that? The gospel is free. And it should always be free. The Bible says freely we received, freely we what? We give. And so Paul, having a deal... Now, I'm very comforted by this chapter because I've been in the ministry now. I, I had the privilege to start as a youth leader at 16 years old. That's when I graduated high school. Went off to Calvary Chapel, had a Bible school up in the Twin Peaks, Big Bear Mountains, of San Bernardino Mountains back then. And they still have the facility, but they moved the school to Mur Murrieta Hot Springs. And I got to go to school there, 1979. And is... It's amazing to me that in all the years since I've come out of that Bible school to see how many men try to whip up these kind of, I call them extras, ec ad addendums maybe, you know, add-ons. Yes, we believe in Jesus and it's all good, but do you do it like we do? And we add a little extra sort of our own perception or rules. And it can come down to how you dress. You know, I've had guys come from the mainland. You don't wear a tie, Pastor. You know, you, you know you have to wear a tie to be a pastor, don't you? I'm like, hey, uh, not in Hawaii. I, I'm dressed. Look, I'm dressed up, Boxy. Look, fancy shorts. It's my fancy shorts, my fancy shoes. You know, my nice shirt. You, this is, this is dressed up here. If you came a couple hours early, you would have seen me in my work clothes. Okay, with, with the cut off sleeves and the t-shirt and carrying all the stuff out here and setting up the chairs and I can't, my, I got forbidden to wear this while I do that because, you know, I kind of messed up my shirts enough. My wife's like, nope, scolding, don't, don't wear that. Wear your work clothes, then change right before service. I always think this is the funniest thing, man. The pastor runs to his vehicle. I feel like uh, Clark Kent, you know. <laughs> Open the rover doors. Someone stands there to block the view. I jump in. Rip out the, you know, off with the work clothes. On with my good clothes. <coughs> but the people from the mainland think that this is really not dressed up. You wear shorts. You preach in shorts? Oh, God forbid. That's horrible. I don't think God can use a guy who preaches in shorts. I think, where did you make up this rule? Where, where does this stuff come from? Let me show you. Because Paul was up against it in the religious leaders of that day and in certain ones, not everyone, but in certain ones. And for some reason, they're still around today. I don't know. These guys replicated. And they just keep showing up. And we have to be careful. Because Galatians 5, chapter, uh, verse 1 reads this. It was for freedom that Christ did what? Set us free. He says, therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. He says, behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. He says, and I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep how much of the law? The whole thing. He says, You've been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by the law. And you've fallen from grace. Whenever you try to earn God's favor by works of the law, Paul says you're severed from who? From Christ. You're breaking yourself away from the very Savior God sent. And you're trying to attain your own righteousness by your own performance. And I tell you, that's a danger. And in fact, in a lot of the cults we have today, they always emphasize some type of works that you have to do to get God's approval, his favor. When the truth is Christ did all the work that we ever need to be approved of God because Christ hung on the cross and his last words as he hung there, it is what? Finished. I have paid the price. It's done. If anybody wants everlasting life, all they have to do is look to Jesus. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, if you don't know the story about, you know, when Moses had to lift up the serpent in the wilderness, remember the, the children of Israel started complaining and murmuring against poor Moses and Aaron. And they were like, meh, meh, meh. why does Moses get to be in charge? Why, why does Aaron get to be the priest? We don't like this. And, 
And then the Lord sent fiery serpents into the into the the whole congregation of Israel there in the wilderness. And it says these serpents were pretty perceptive. Those serpents, the scripture says, they only bit in certain people. Anyone know who they bit? Who's read this story? Only the people who grumbled and complained against. Mo I love this. God goes, Moses, don't worry about this. I got this covered. I'm going to send in these really venomous snakes, and they're going to take care of the grumblers for you. <laughs> Thanks, Lord. Could you do that today? I mean, <laughs> please. This is good stuff. I mean, have you guys read this story? This story is awesome. I mean, the Lord just goes, Moses, don't worry. I got this covered. And just to, now in God's grace, the people, when they started getting bit, of course, as soon as you get by those poisonous uh, vipers, you've only got, a short, I mean short amount of time. They say sometimes 30 to 60 seconds till the venom is entering your system and beginning to paralyze your voluntary muscles. Your involuntary muscles are still working. Your heart, your lungs and stuff, they're still going, but you can't move your arms or your legs. And you start to be paralyzed. And, and by the way, they're coming next. You know, they're going to they're gonna be paralyzed soon thereafter. But But while you're in that frozen state, Barely able to turn your head, the Lord goes, I'm going to, they, they started crying, Moses, Moses, ask God to take away the snakes. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this in the book of Numbers, but they cried, God, take away the snakes. And the Lord said, this is, by the way, extra credit reading for you guys, uh, Numbers 21. They said, please, Moses, ask God to take away the, saints, the snakes. And God goes, um, Moses, I'm not taking away the snakes. I got a better idea. You go fashion a, a serpent out of bronze and put it on your staff. And anyone who gets bit by one of these fiery serpents, what does he have to do to to receive the anti venom? Now, by the way, this I love this story because I hate needles. Okay, and so this is like the best ever anti venom story ever. I mean, if you got bit by a snake, the Lord said all you had to do was what? Look. At the bronze serpent on top of whose staff? Moses. Oh, wait, we don't want him to be the leader anyway. And now i got to look at him? That's not fair. Couldn't someone else hold the stick? Nope. What was God saying to the Israelites? I pick my choose. I choose my my man. And and you don't get to say anything. And And not only that, I confer on him the power to deliver you from your punishment of your grumbling. But he didn't take away the snakes. He provided a way to not die from the bite. Now, I love this story because I've been to Israel a few times. And if you come to befriend any of the Jewish people, you, you kind of find out they have this little bit of arrogance about them. A little bit of, um, I'm better than the rest of the world. I'm, I'm God's elect. The chosen. And not only that, but they're kind of stubborn. In fact, the, the prophet uh, Jeremiah, he said that they were stiff necked. What a nice thing. I don't want anyone to call me stiff necked. It's Ed, it, it, you might say in English, stiff necked. But that sounds weird. They were stiff necked. They just, they would not, I mean, I don't care what God says. I, I, there's Moses with the stick. I'm not looking. I don't care. I don't like him being the leader anyway. They die. I mean, God said, I'll take care of it, Moses. And for the... F Lord, could I have a stick? And a, and a serpent? You know, I mean, and you take care of all the complainers? Because they still exist. They, they, they did. They, they bred. They multiplied. They came back. And they still go around churches. Your church is not conventional. You know, you don't do it the way we do it. Okay. I re you know, personally, I rejoice in the diversity of the body of Christ. Because there's different pastors that reach different people that I could never reach. And there are men that are called to pulpits. Like, my heart aches for the ones in the south of the... I'm talking about the, the mainland, you know, in the southern Bible Belt, where it's really warm in the summers. 
and they actually have ex they have buildings, but with swamp cooling. No, no AC. Oh, and if they, some of them don't even have a, a swamp cooler, and the and the church is a little building is so hot inside, and you know what the expectation of the poor pastor is? He's got to wear a three piece suit, tie, choked up. And if you've ever been in a warm setting in a three piece suit, and you got to speak, the sweat begins to roll. And you're just uncomfortable. I mean, and you can tell that they're, un I mean, the guys are whipping their handkerchiefs out and wiping their foreheads and, and the Lord, and they look like they're going to die of heat exhaustion. You know, my heart goes out for them. But there's this cultural expectation they have to wear that suit. They, I want to tell them, just get some Hawaiian, you know, attire. Wear what I wear, you'll be better. They would probably like that, but their congregation will revolt. And why is that? I mean, why do we come up with stuff like Does God look at what we wear? Is that what he's, is that his concern, the outward? No. He's looking inward at the heart. And this is an inward issue. When men try to get God's approval by doing works of the law, instead of by receiving the gift that he's offering, they're just trying to say to God, God, I don't need you to do it for me. I'll help you out. Let me do it for you. And guys, it's impossible for us to fulfill the law. That's why he had to send his son. And we do much better to not try to attain our righteousness through works of the law, but rather just receive it as a gift. Now, Paul's going to continue talking to these guys about this in Galatians 5, and he's going to point out it really comes down to some really simple things. These simple things, he says... Let me show you. He says in verse 4, you who were severed from Christ, you are seeking to be justified by the law? He says, you've fallen from grace. He says, for, for we, through the Spirit, by faith, are awaiting the hope of righteousness. This is what we're waiting for. For in Christ Jesus himself, there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. It, it, it means nothing. He says, but rather faith, working through love. Now he says, you were running well, but who hindered you from obeying the truth? He says, this persuasion did not come from him who calls. He says, a little leaven leavens how much? The whole lump. He says, and I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view. But the one who is disturbing you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Paul's, Paul's not naming who it was. He maybe didn't know, but he knew somebody was disturbing them with this teaching that they could attain righteousness through works of the law. And he says, whoever it is, I have confidence in the Lord that you will adopt no other view. You won't listen to this guy. And, but, but he says, I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? then the stumbling block of the cross would be abolished. Would that those who are troubling you, and this is how much he cared for these guys, would that they would even mutilate themselves. This is not a nice Greek word. It's the word we say mutilate is to cut themselves off down below the waist. You know, forget circumcision. We're just getting rid of everything. That's what he's saying. If you... If these men come and teach this stuff, would that they just be, what, what is the word in English, castrated? Yeah. Emasculated, yeah. All right, fix them. <laughs> That's what Paul, you know, sometimes the Bible is pretty graphic, isn't it? But does that get the point across that this is not acceptable? Don't be teaching extra stuff to the gospel. Don't add to the things what God didn't add. It's not right with him. He doesn't approve. And he uses strong language from his apostle Paul here to say, don't do this. The guy who's doing this, better that he mutilate himself than that he keeps pursuing this, this teaching to stumble people. Now, Paul goes on and says in verse 13, for you guys, you were called to freedom. Brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. 
This is the whole freeing thing of the gospel. Is no longer do I have to live a life in bondage to my flesh. I'm freed. In Romans chapter 6, when we talk about baptism, we, we study how when you're baptized, you're joined to Jesus in two things. First, in the likeness of his death, and then in the likeness of his what? Resurrection. Resurrection. And when you are resurrected with Christ, it says, consider, Paul says in Romans 6, use your mind to consider. I'm now risen with Christ. And just like sin has no power over Christ, sin no longer has power over you. That's freeing. Now, did he free us so we would go back and keep sinning? Oh, God forbid, he said in Romans 6, 1, right? What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace might abound or increase? He said, God forbid. May it never be. You were freed from sin so you could enjoy freedom. And it was for freedom that you've been set free. We need to not go back to those yokes of slavery. Those of you who've been Christians for a while, have you ever known a Christian who started, God freed them from a vice, and they were so rejoicing, man. I, you know, they maybe share their testimony with you, how they used to be in bondage to a certain sin, and God freed them. And they're rejoicing, and, and, you, and, you, and, and you follow their life for a few years, and then I don't know what happens, but sometimes for a few folks, maybe five, ten years down the road, you, you hear that they're not going to church anymore. And yes, what happened? And what are they doing? Oh, they're back to drinking, or they're back to whatever they did back in their old B.C. days, before Christ days, you know. In their old days, they've just gone back to what they used to do. This letter would be great for them. Paul would say, it was for freedom Christ set you free. And verse 1 says, you are now to what? Stand firm. You're not to sit there and go, I'll go back to what I used to do. You were freed from that. You know, when, when God set the Israelites free from, from Egypt, remember that whole story, Moses leading them out of the bonds, 430 years of slavery. When God brought them out of Egypt, he was, his intent was to take them into Canaan's land, cross the wilderness of Zin, over across the Jordan, and into the promised land. But when they left Egypt, the Lord wanted to make sure they didn't go back. So he parted the sea to get them out, right? What did he do after they crossed? You guys know because the Egyptians were riding in behind, right? And the enemy's coming and whoosh, the waters close in. And he drowns the army of the Egyptians, of, of Pharaoh's army, in the, in the Dead Sea. He, he, uh, I'm sorry, in the Red Sea. He closes up, poof, they're dead. And he says, they stood on the shore going, hey, I will sing unto the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider, what? Thrown into the sea. This is a great day. And as he delivered them and took away their enemy, he closed the way back. He closed the waters back up and said, we're not going back. Symbolically, it's a great picture for us to know when Christ delivered us from our bonds, whatever sin we were in, and he made a way to get us out of that hole that we were in, he says, you're just like Israel. I did everything for Israel for your example. Now, if he closed the way back for them, are we supposed to be taken away back? Are we supposed to go back to our sin? Did Christ just set us free so that we could go, yeah, man, I'm free. I can do whatever I want. In fact, I think I'll go sin. By the way, do you think there's people that have actually thought this? I know there is because they talk to me and they're like justifying it. It's okay, pastor. I'm free. Christ set me free. He did not set you free so you'd go back to bondage. You know, they were in the wilderness of Zin. They were crying, it was better back in Egypt. I went over this last week. League soup. Yuck. They wanted to go back. That wasn't what the Lord had for them. The Lord had a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. A, a land where they would have houses, what they didn't build to live in, trees to sit under, what they didn't plant, they could eat the fruit of. He was going to, he prepared a great thing for them, a blessing. But there is a weird part of our, our wiring that sometimes 
we're more comfortable with what we're familiar with. We get uncomfortable with the newness. Oh, no, he's bringing me somewhere I've never been. It's a little scary. I think I want to go back. And I know guys will go back to their drug addict days, to the habit they once had. And they were doing really well. And you're like, what are you doing? And somebody forgot to teach them this. It was for freedom Christ set them free. And there is a responsibility you have as a believer now. You are to stand firm and not be subject. Look at verse 1 of Galatians 5. If you haven't highlighted this verse, please do. In your Bible, you are to not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Whatever sin you were in, that thing was your, was your fetters, your bonds, your yoke of slavery. That if you, were, if you were addicted to some drug, you were addicted to alcohol, you were addicted to pornography, whatever sin it is that had its hooks on you, when Christ sets you free from that, you're, you're done. You don't have to go back to that. And even if it represents itself in your life, does this happen, by the way, to new Christians, old Christians, in-betweeners? It doesn't matter where you are in your walk with the Lord. The devil knows what you came out of. And he, I was telling the, the young men last night at the college study, he doesn't have to be real creative with his ammunition. You know, John tells us that the lusts of this world are the same ones. Lust of the eyes, right? Lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. Do you think the devil doesn't know that that's the... He's like, you know, all I got to do is dangle the, the bait in front of them. I mean, if, they, if, they're, if they're struggling with lust of the flesh, I'll just put some suggestive advertising into the, into the commercials on the ball game. I mean, he'll use whatever. Oh, and then he'll say, it's um, sex sells, you know, marketing. It's just marketing. Yeah. We're just marketing this stuff right. It's amazing how the enemy knows how to get people. Sorry. We need a new one of these. Bad. <sighs> well, guys, since we were called to freedom... Verse 13 says, don't turn this freedom into an opportunity for your flesh. Instead, use your freedom to do something else. And this is the most positive thing I could end this sermon with today is that when it comes to what do you do with your freedom, I can tell you it's right here. What does it say? But through love, serve one another. You are set free from your sin so that through love, you could help serve others. You could make an impact on other people's lives. But you can't do it if you're in bondage to your sin. I know some Christians say, oh, it's okay, Pastor. I only do this once in a while. It doesn't really affect my, my you know, service to God. I'm like, baloney. They, they don't understand how much it messes up their opportunities to serve others through love. Because they get consumed and they get into this trap of, well, I'm going to go to church and serve others, but i got to go take care of my pet sin. I'll be right back. Now, I'm not going to tell you which pet sins they do. You could fill in the blanks on that one. But they do this. They, they're like, uh, I, I, I meant to be at Bible study, but something came up. Oh, the old something came up. Were you busy serving someone else in love? No. What, 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 and this is what it's going to come down to. Next week, I'm going to help you see, how do I know whether I'm fulfilling this law of the Spirit that Jesus is describing? The law of the Spirit where we walk by the Spirit and we do the things what Christ would have us do. Or do I walk according to the flesh? And in the flesh, we really are only interested in serving one person. Guess who it is? Ourselves. And we're going to see one of the most quoted parts of the book of Galatians, the things that were called the fruits of the Spirit versus the deeds of the flesh. And it kind of, as a new Christian, by the way, if you have any new Christian friends, I want you to have them tune into next week's sermon. Because it's a really great one to help you start to kind of gain understanding of how am I doing it right? In a real practical way. The simplicity, I love the simplicity of the gospel. 
It just comes down to this. Well, what's the next verse say in verse 14? For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, one word. What word is that? Do you guys see it? It's a quote. This is, by the way, some of your Bibles may have your, your text in like italics or, or in all caps. That's like oh, different ways the publishers signify. This is not Paul saying this. He's saying, he's quoting from the Old Testament. And in this case, verse 14, you see that there? It's fulfilled in one word. What is that word? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. Leviticus. Isn't that Leviticus? 19, 18, 19, right in there. That, that was, that's part of the law, Levitical law. That one word, and when I say one word, I don't mean like literally one word. It's a, one saying. You know, when they say, when someone gives a, a good sermon, they'll say, oh, that was a good word. They shared, that was really, that, that was a good word, Pastor. This is a good word. It's a really simple good word. And it's the fulfillment of the whole law. Love your neighbor as what? Yourself. I don't think I have to overcomplicate this. I think I just have to say, everybody, would you go this week and live this? Just do unto your neighbors. What, what does it say? As you would have them do unto you. That's what Jesus, when he elaborated in, in Matthew's gospel, just do unto others as you have them do it. It's a very simple concept. We have all of these people struggling right now with all of the things going on in the world and the injustices and ISIS killing. Do you guys, we should be praying for our fellow brothers and sisters that are being beheaded. Right now, there are Christians, I mean, if we were in another place in the world, we'd be killed for what we're doing right here. Out in public, studying the Bible. But I want to ask you to pray a prayer that you might not have thought of because do you guys remember in the Bible Saul was persecuting the Christians and the Lord, I, I'd say he gib slapped him. He, those of you that watch NCIS know what I'm talking about. We got whales and dolphins. Oh, dolphins, look, little spinners. Hey, can you get that on the tape? We got to show these guys. Now, this is the coolest part about doing videos. They're right there. There's a whole bunch of spinner dolphins. See them out there on the water, guys? You can. Isn't that beautiful? My wife wants to hurry and go get her suits on and swim with them. For those of you who don't know, she's been dragging me out in the ocean and get me swimming. This is, oh, look at a little baby spinning, jumping up and down. Woohoo! Hi, guys. Oh, isn't that great? I love our wallpaper. It is so, it's so awesome to tell people that this is what we see, you know. And then this is the best part. We've been on the radio for a long time, and on the, I get calls. You don't really have the whales behind you. You don't really have dolphins. Yes, I do. But now on YouTube, I can say, just look, you know. Dylan, pan way out there. And uh, Mark, get out of the shot. <laughs> Can't you tell we're trying to show the audience? Well, guys, I want you to just know this is a word that I hope you'll hear is a good word for your spirit. <coughs> you were set free. Set free. Not so you'd go back to the bonds. So you could now stand firm against those things. Don't do it anymore. And in that freedom from the sin that you have, you now can fulfill that great, that great word that Jesus taught. You can love your neighbor. Love him as yourself. And when you do that, the whole law, the whole law is fulfilled in this. Just do that. Just with love, serve your neighbor. And watch what God does for his kingdom. When it comes to those guys that are beheading our brethren, I'm praying that God, just like he gib slapped Paul when he was Saul, he smacked him, he smote him with blindness for three. I got a question. If God did that to Saul... Could he do it to ISIS? Would you guys pray with me as we close that God would just... It was a spiritual revelation to, to Saul. He was persecuting the Christians, and God went, stop it, you're persecuting me. 
Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth me? And he came back with a quick comeback. Who art thou, Lord? <laughs> that I might serve thee. And he said, I am Jesus. Now, Jesus was already resurrected. So my question is, if God could do that to, to Saul after Jesus was res risen from the dead and seated at the right hand, could God do that to ISIS today? I mean, if they're that zealous for the wrong, how great would they be for preaching? You know, seriously, I think these guys would turn into some pretty zealous preachers. We should pray for their salvation. And just ask the Lord, have mercy on them just like he did on us. You know, because I don't know about you, but I needed God's mercy. And I'm grateful for it. And I think if we pray for them, that God would have mercy on them. Maybe if it's just one or two. What if they're the next Saul to Paul? What if they're the Paul for their region? And they're good. Did, by the way, did Paul suffer for the gospel? Yeah. Much suffering. But did the gospel get furthered? Yes. And wouldn't that be cool if we start hearing reports that the guys in ISIS are becoming Christians? And now instead of killing the other Christians, they're helping save them. And they're, I mean, guys, my God, your God, I hope you understand, is a very big God. And if he can take Saul and make him into Paul, if he can take me and take me from a guy who wasn't following him to make me a preacher for the gospel. This is the funnest part of this whole YouTube experience is seeing the people that knew me back in high school going, I can't believe you're a preacher. <laughs> you, like, voted least likely to ever go there. You know, that's not what they wrote in my yearbook, that I would become a preacher. But see, God is a God of great... If he can do those works in us, can he do it in them? Would you join me? Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we do indeed pray your prayer, Lord, for, for those, that, those that are persecuting you and your son, I, I pray you would bring salvation to their door, that you would let these ones go from persecutor to preacher, just like Saul to Paul. As you changed his life and came into him, Lord, would you come into their lives? And I ask you, Father, that you would do this great miracle, on, uh, for, well, Lord, especially for our brother's sake. For the brothers and sisters right now being persecuted, please grant them great mercy today. And grace, Lord, if you're going to allow them to go home to be with you, make their going easy. Give them that comfort in their heart. It breaks my heart, Lord, to hear of our brethren being beheaded and beaten and cruelly abused. So, Lord, please give them extra measure of mercy and grace today. We just intercede on their behalf. And we give you thanks for our freedom, Lord. For as long as we have it, Lord, let us be heralding the truth of your Son and the love and the grace that he provides to us. And that sweet gift of salvation, Lord, thanks for that. We thank you for that, for Jesus. And in his name we pray. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.